I'm, uh, we'll limit it to First Timothy, because I think that's probably all we're going to be able to get through this quarter. But anyway, it's good to have everyone here. Thank you very much for your interest in the subject. Um, I think as I'd said in the first uh, class that um, I'm really bad about casually reading through things and not really stopping and contemplating on it. And so this class has really been beneficial for me and it's really been an eye-opener as we start to approach uh, these subjects and particularly these issues that were taking place at Ephesus. And so, uh, so we'll continue this morning. We're going to complete or attempt to complete chapter 3 and get into chapter 4. Uh, before we begin, though, let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer. Holy God, our Creator and our Father in heaven, we come to you at this time thankful for this day and this time we have to come together to study from your Holy Word. Of course, Father, we're thankful for providing us with your will. Of course, we're also thankful, Father, that not only being our Creator, but we're thankful for giving us Jesus and that he died on the cross on behalf of our sins. Father, we pray to you, we may always be mindful of that. Strengthen us and guide us, but also when we do fall short, that you may forgive us of those sins. Father, we're thankful for the church here at Centerville Road. We know that there's many among us that are sick, our shut-ins, those who have recently lost loved ones, and we pray to you, comfort, protect, and encourage them as only you can. We pray to you, be with us this day as we enter into this Bible study, and later this morning as we enter into this worship services. Father, we may do this according to your will, and it's in your Son's holy name we offer this prayer. Amen. Okay, so uh, last week uh, we had stopped... We we're about ready to get to verse 12. But let me, uh, just real briefly, let me just go back and pick it up in, in verse 8 because we're looking at deacons here. And uh, he says here in verse 8 of 1 Timothy 3, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. Verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, that being the Word of God. Verse 10, but let these also first be tested then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. And then verse 11, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, and faithful in all things. And so we leave off here in verse 12. And so let me read here verses 12 and 13, and we'll make some comments about that. And we'll pick up also with the discussion that we had started to have there at the end of Bible class uh, last Sunday. But he says here in verse 12, Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. And in verse 13, For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So here in verse 12, they must be the husband of one wife. Uh, same thing is spoken about with the elders. And then they must also be good managers of their children and their household. Same thing is mentioned about elders. So again, it goes to the, these leadership roles within the church that how is that leadership initially demonstrated? It's demonstrated in the household. That's the training ground for elders. And for those who are accomplished and are successful at that and do that very well, those are the kind of leaders we need for the church, and it kind of goes hand in hand. Certainly the foundation of the church is the cross, but just how important is that with the oldest institution in the Bible, that being marriage, and then that being the family, and the importance of that, and how that carries over to the church family, and the importance there. So just like with the elders, uh, the deacons also have the same requirement. So uh, the rewards for faithful service as a deacon are really twofold, as he's mentioned here over these last few verses, um, and that being one of a good reputation of high standing and increased confidence in dealing with other people and also with God. Presumably, this confidence builds on a clear conscience. Paul said nothing really about the duties of uh, deacons, just like really it's kind of the same way with the elders. It's more focus there on the character of the kind of individuals that need to be holding these two roles within the church. This indicates that he did not associate specific tasks with the office. He seems to have intended that deacons should function as official servants of the church in whatever capacity the elders may see that there's a need. They were, in effect, the elders' assistants, kind of. They were, getting, they were given direction by the elders. 
So the elders' office apparently uh, may have arose out of Jewish religious life. If you go back and just do a search in the New Testament, uh, elders are mentioned throughout the first uh, four books of the, of the New Testament. And so within the Jewish community, they had elders, and we'll speak about here momentarily, that it seems like also the same thing, this office of deacon, and while it may not actually been called deacon, that you did have individuals that were taken on those same kind of roles within the temples, within the Jewish community, that we're going to see here in the New Testament. Uh, the deacon's office seems to have developed from an incident in the early history of the church, and we had spoken about Acts chapter 6 um, back at, toward the end of a worship service, or at the end of Bible class last week, and we'll touch on that momentarily. But uh, we do have there, and I think I use the term precedent there in Acts chapter 6. There, there's an early indication that eventually this work that's being done there, that eventually there's going to be an office for that, that the deacons are going to take on that role. But uh, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, Luke did not call these men deacons. Uh, they were appointed to assist the apostles in Acts chapter 6, um, but deacon in that passage is never mentioned. Uh, never, uh, nevertheless, that event apparently, as I said, is a precursor to what we would see here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 in terms of the establishment of deacons. Um, in fact, uh, real quickly, let, let's just kind of look at Acts chapter 6, uh, because there are some unique things here that we don't see in 1 um, in, um, in Timothy 3. But I'll read the first five verses here of Acts chapter 6, and it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. And this is the Greek community. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That phrase is going to be key, what we're going to mention here in just a moment. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over the business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So I went back, and uh, I'm no Greek scholar, but I did go back and look at the Greek terms for here, and it is interesting. Um, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, when he mentions, likewise, deacons must be reverent, he's mentioning specifically the office, the title there of deacon. That Greek term is... Uh, called a diakonos, and the meaning of that word says one who executes the commands of another, especially of a master, a servant, an attendant, a minister, the servant of a king, and it also mentions here a deacon, one who by virtue of the office assigned to him by the church, cares for the poor and his charge of and distributes, or distributes the money collected for their use, a waiter and one who serves food and drink. That was from a... Uh, a Greek lexicon is a Greek dictionary there. But in two verses later in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, he says here, but let those also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons. And that whole phrase there is another Greek term, but it's very similar to the one that's mentioned in verse 8, and that's called diakono. And apparently my understanding with Greek is the ends of these words are very important. And so the meaning of that word there, the function of these deacons, here's the definition. It's just almost identical, and it says, to be a servant, attendant, domestic, to serve, wait upon, to minister to one, rendering ministering offices, to be served, ministered unto, to wait at a table, and offer food or drink, and it goes on and on and on. So the second Greek term here uh, that is mentioned there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, serve as deacons. That same Greek term is used over there in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. So while you look at the context of the passage, and it does not mention deacon, and I don't, I don't believe that the office has been established, at least there's no indication there in Acts chapter 3, certainly we do see there an early precedent that there's activities going on that eventually will be assigned to the um, office of deacon. But it is interesting how early on that with the church that there was a need for additional men to help with the elders on the functions that were going on there with the early church. 
And so I do find that's, that's really kind of interesting, that there is a precedent that's set there. There's an early indication of this need. But again, the establishment of uh, Deacon, um, I don't believe it had occurred at that time. Um, I'd seen a timeline of Acts, and I was never able to source it, and I'd kind of take it with a grain of salt. But um, the timeline for the first eight verses of Acts all falls within one year. And um, within that year, you have Acts chapter 6. And so at this time, you know, had it been established, maybe, it, maybe the office of deacon had been established. But unfortunately, there's just no indication here that these individuals are actually deacons. But as I said, the fact that that same Greek terms mentioned there, I'm thinking at least there was activities that were going on that would eventually lead to um, this position of deacons. So I find it really interesting as you start to look at that and see how this is going to evolve over time that there is a need there for the church and um, the importance of that work can also allow the elders to concentrate on other tasks within the church that this position was created. So, but at this point, uh, was there any comments? Do you want to make a comment, Elsie? Uh, Let me. elders there where you read there in uh, Titus, he showed both as a waiter and the official deacons. The NOS surfix is uh, the one that they use, same surfix they use in Acts chapter 6. So it was never used. See, the only surfix that was used was NOS. And that's the same as the ones in 6 and uh, in Titus, but those that were in six, I'm kind of confusing, <laughs> they never had the title NAS. They didn't have that title. Yeah, no, they didn't have the title. And it that's was, the official title, you know, right? Right, yes. And it's, it's just, it was just, they were doing some of the work <laughs> that later you would find it's the deacons right, that are doing it. Some of the but they're work. not titled. So we're trying to press it in there. <laughs> we shouldn't have to press it in there. They didn't have that official title. Right. Because that NAS makes a difference. Yes, they didn't I agree. I agree, yeah. Because they are, they are different Greek words. And so, yeah, so from that, I don't think we can assign there's a title there. So, But when you brought it up last week, I thought, I didn't go back and look at that. Let's go back and look at that. So very interesting. I'd really like to learn Greek. It's just so intimidating to, to go back and try to look at that. So I'm glad I have reference books that I can look at. So. <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, good. I think maybe we need to get together and talk. <laughs> if, if you could help me teach any, I... Then. <laughs> sure, sure we do. We do. And I, think so, and I think that's what's nice about those resources. If you have those resources, use them. You know, it's just a matter of we have to use them responsibly, but certainly. So, anyone else have any comments? Okay. Well, let's uh, go ahead and conclude here, um, chapter 3. And so he says here in verse 14, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, the support of the truth. So here Paul explained the reason for writing this epistle. And in particular, what he had just said, he also prepared for what he would yet say. He did so to impress on Timothy a view of the church that was foundational to all its instructions in his letters. This is all foundational information that needed to be conveyed to the church there at Ephesus. And unfortunately, you know, we don't know if Paul ever returned. So the, the last instructions that maybe were given from Paul to the church at Ephesus was going to be these letters that he had written to, uh, to Timothy. Uh, verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, and that being the word of God. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. So that verse in verse 16 there, he speaks about Christ arrived Jesus came in the flesh and lived among humanity. He was approved. He was shown to be right by the Spirit by his life here on earth. He was without sin. 
speaks about he was adored. He was adored by angels. He was acclaimed. He was concerned about all, including the Gentiles. He was accepted. He was believed by the world. And he was ascended. He was taken up in glory. And just like we have some examples earlier in this book, um, just another one verse and how nicely that um, Paul is able to kind of summarize right there about Jesus and his life. So he concludes uh, chapter 3 here. And so you see how that flows there. Chapter 1, you have this charge. There's these issues that are going on in Ephesus. And then he starts to reveal some of the things that are going on in the worship services with prayer and then, of course, with women that were out there that were teaching. And it's just natural here in chapter 3, he says, no, these are the individuals that need to be teaching there at Ephesus. You have all kinds of issues. And let's start out with church leadership. How absolutely paramount is church leadership to maintaining the faith? It's paramount. If you don't have strong elders, if you don't have these men in character, uh, sadly, you're not going to have a faithful church. And, and we see that time and again. You know, um, two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, we had read that article from that newspaper in Abilene, from Abilene and how you see there are churches out there that are starting to consider women to be elders and deacons, and they already have some examples of where they're starting to teach or actually preaching in the worship services. Well, I think that's directly reflected on... Um, the leadership of those churches out there or the lack of. And so I think here, this is, it's just natural. This is why Paul spent some time on this and how the focus on the elders and the deacons, these are men of character. He does not, he does not spend but just a passing thought on any of the tasks that they have. But most importantly, these have to be men of very high character. So just some concluding uh, remarks here about leadership and about teachers. So there had been much that had changed um, here over the past century. Um, from the styles of leadership we find within the eldership to concerns about programs, activities, the architecture of buildings, the patterns of worship. There's been a lot that's changed in 100 years and also the roles, the functions that elders have. And as time goes by and as society advances, you know, oftentimes society also becomes far more complicated. And so the role of elder has changed over time, not in terms of keeping the faith, but all these other aspects of, of, um, of leadership within the church, all these decisions that have to be made about the function of the church. However, um, to be the church of the New Testament, there must be a bold claim that some things do not change over the past 2,000 years, and that is the Word of God. That is God's commands. Uh, these epistles here were written to ensure that the church is faithful to its trust, and that's what Paul is telling Timothy. You guard that trust. You've been given this trust. Guard it. According to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, Paul places his trust in leaders who emerge in the local communities to guide the congregations in truth. The church at Ephesus already had a leadership structure well known to its readers back in Acts chapter 20. And sadly, I think I made the comment last week, I think that the eldership at the church at Ephesus was struggling. These things were being allowed to play out in the church. And so in part, I think this is also another reminder that uh, Paul is telling Timothy here. Make sure that the men that are leading these congregations, and Ephesus included, that these are men of character. These are men that are faithful. The fact that Paul lists special qualifications for these leaders indicates that the church recognized the special office of leadership and that the list of qualifications listed here indicates the need of a significant leadership structure for the survival of the church. Paul's instructions for a church facing the crisis of change is to give attention to the leadership of the church. Chaos cannot be prevented only if the church is in the hands of proven leaders. Primary concern is that of character and the contact of those who are chosen. As we'll mention here in a moment, and we've mentioned before, that, you know, these, these characteristics that are mentioned here in this third chapter, not only are they something that should appeal to 
individuals in the church, that these are the kind of leaders we want. But often, most of these characters are also very attractive to people outside the church. They're very admirable qualities. And along with these godly men and the character that they have is also going to be able to influence those individuals outside the church. But I also mentioned, you know, oftentimes these early churches, they were in homes that they, were, they had their worship services. And you can imagine how the local officials would get maybe a little nervous seeing all these people congregate in this one house. What's going on? Are you trying to undermine our government? What are you doing? But these godly leaders, these elders, individuals see them and they know them. Oh, yeah, I know him. Yeah, we don't have anything to be concerned about. He's a man of very high character. So that's why it's also important that um, these characteristics and the leaders, these elders, that they also are appealing to the larger world. These are qualities that are admired throughout the world. We'll touch more on that here in a moment. In the opening chapter, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul indicates that the highest goal of Christian instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Uh, by contrast, one can observe the results of false teaching by the corrupt lives which results from it. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 5, Paul writes here, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which comes envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourselves. That's the result of these false teachers. But he contrasts that there with the very beginning of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and what Christian instruction results in, that being of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So there is a very clear contrast there between these false teachers and these individuals, godly individuals, that care about truth. So healthy teaching equals healthy lives. Leaders are not only expected to teach good conduct, or excuse me, good conduct, let's try that again, good conduct, but they're also to be models of that good conduct. They cannot be separated. Practice what you preach. The treatment of elders focus more on the person, the character of the teachers, than on their task. The instruction would be hollow without the demeanor that had been mentioned above. You can teach all day, but if you don't have that character and it shows that you're living that kind of life of what you're teaching, the instruction's hollow. It doesn't mean anything. So why are these particular qualifications listed something like Galatians chapter 5, 5, verse 22 and 23? You know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, these qualities found in this chapter that we've looked at here uh, are rarely found elsewhere in the Bible. It's unique. Not to say that there's the ex same expectation is meant, but in terms of the listing of these things, it's just not every day you go through and you find these lists all confined together there in one section of the Bible. Many of these qualities were also admired among the general population of the first century, as I just mentioned. A similar list was also known to exist for military generals. Generals were respected in the first century. And that's why I say that you see the outside public that's looking at these leaders within the church, these elders, they would have that association with someone else that they would hold to very high regard, and that being generals. These attributes of leadership were needed to ensure someone was not put in a position of blackmail, um, irresponsible with others, and not able to make clear decisions. So a lot of what we see here in these attributes here in this chapter, it just falls into place for good leaders. But that was something that you had to be concerned about corruption. There was many leaders in the first centuries, you can imagine, that were probably corrupt. But for the leadership of the church, they had to be blameless. At the head of this list, in this chapter, verse 2, it says here, be blameless. Some translations say above reproach. 
But Christians were under scrutiny by neighbors, looking for opportunities to accuse them of immoral conduct. And being blameless was needed to protect the church's reputation. The meaning of blameless is expanded by this passage in verse 2. It's the highest values of that day of the first century of being temperament or tempered and sober-minded. That is self-control. Those words are very similar there. And being respectable and showing hospitality. Um, this was respectability to the outside world. Verse 3, the emphasis is placed again on respectability. Not given to wine, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but covetous. All these qualities focus on an orderly life, one of respectability and one of order. In verse 7, it says there, have a good testimony with outsiders, so he will not fall into disgrace. Again, it's important to have that reputation, not only within the church, but also to have that good reputation that individuals outside the church would see in you. The reputation of the church was a vital concern as its selected leaders. The concern appears to be central to the qualifications of leaders, and the concern to appoint leaders were for only those who would demonstrate qualities that non-Christians would appreciate. However, not all these qualities listed were appreciated by the pagan world. There are some of these things that were not looked upon well. The husband of one wife. There would probably be an issue, at least for the general public, on that. And not being a novice, not being a recent convert. Uh, but such a position of leadership might cause one to be conceited and to fall. So while most of these qualities were good, there were some of them that uh, at least uh, certain people out within the community would probably not looked upon as being um, very respectable. All leaders represent distinct values that grow out of their commitment, and these values do not conflict with general human values, the highest value of our society. So if the church is to transform communities, and you remember here we talked about this change and the concern about this change that's at least trying to take place within the church, that if the church is going to try to transform these communities to become Christians, it needed examples of those who lived transformed lives. And we must select those who demonstrate the power of the faith in their own lives. We'd also mentioned uh, about the task of the leader. You know, and it does, just doesn't really say much in this chapter in terms of what specific roles outside of being an overseer that elders would have. Um, so the list of these quali qualifications has played an important role within the church when leaders are chosen. And as I mentioned, it seems like maybe that's about the only time we go and we look at this, this passage or maybe when we hear um, a sermon is when the church is about ready to start having to pick new, more elders or having to pick uh, more deacons. These passages appear to be clear in defining the qualifications of leaders than in providing guidelines for the tasks that they would be um, undertaking. Uh, I would say that many of our most serious conflicts today are associated with the task of elders. And it's just like reading that article about what was going on in, in uh, some of these churches in Abilene. Some of the decisions these elders were making, that's tasks that they're making, there's decisions they're making. And that's why I say I think that probably it's the task of the decisions these elders are making. That's what's going to be controversial. Uh, we may unwittingly impose upon the structure of the church um, qualities that we would maybe find in political institutions. Some may infer that we need to have leadership that's authoritarian, that rules with an iron fist. Others may view it more as a form of democracy, which majority rules. And I think, sadly, maybe increasingly more and more that's what we're seeing. And when I say that, I'm not talking about other decisions of the church, but I'm talking about decisions that go right back to the commands of the Bible. Do you agree with this or not? Well, you know what? Women in the worship service and preaching, majority rules on that. And sadly enough, it seems like there's some indication that that is taking place, if, at least with some churches. Um, although 1 Timothy 3 says little about the task of the leader, it provides significant insights in verse 4 and 5. It must manage, uh, they must manage their own household well and see that children obey them with proper respect. All right, so this demonstrates, again, the capacity to lead. The family, as I said, is the basic unit within the church, and Christian leaders are thus based on a pattern of authority in the home. Uh, the church is God's household 
and elders here correspond to, to that of a father in an ancient household. It seems like that's kind of the indication there in terms of at least uh, kind of the image you have of elders. It's like a respected father of a household. Uh, the word rule and take care here are parallel terms. The, the word rule is also used in 1 Timothy 5. It's used in 1 Thessalonians 5. The word has the dual meaning of that being the head and also one who cares for those who bears responsibility. It is a combination of caring authority and authoritative care that again would characterize that of being a father in an ancient household. When Paul says, how will he take care of, in verse 5, concerning the family, we see the same nature of his authority. The term rendered, meaning care for, is used for the concerns that also we find that same words used concerning the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verse 34. You see how he went out of the way to take care of that individual. And that's the same kind of connotation you get here from um, that being the role of an elder when it mentions there of taking care. Thus he cares for the church like a father, and he spoke with authority defining the Christian marriage, or the Christian, excuse me, the Christian message. Parental care is opposed to autocratic care or controlling. And at the same time, through growth and experience, he was to protect the church by way of sound doctrine against challenges to its identity. So wherever the church has functioned as a democracy, I take it it's probably failed. Because I would say the majority of the population is just going to want to do what they want to do, and they don't, just don't simply want to follow or have faith in what the Bible says. And that's why a democratic form of leadership within the church just does not work, and I do not believe the Bible teaches that, that it's supposed to be one of democratic nature. Truth is not established by such a process, and the church needs an authoritative style of leader, but not an autocratic or controlling leader. So in the ancient house, churches, congregations had no capital expenses. They didn't have really these large buildings to maintain. They didn't have fixed expenditures. They didn't have rent or budgets per se. Thus, the authority of leaders was considerably different from what we find today. The authority was to teach the Christian faith and to guide the destiny of the church. The nature of this authority is suggested in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where it says, All these things that you have heard from me among my witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And as I said, that's about the only task that it does actually mention there. So the concern is to ensure the deposit of the faith is guarded by reliable men. And having limited um, those who teach... He turns to those who will be church teachers. So the elders there, and as I mentioned, that's the one task that they mentioned, is they must be able to teach. And that was because of the problems that were going on in Ephesus, that that was certainly something that was needed. So we have a history of guarding the faith and passing that on to um, further generations. And the significance of this authority for teaching is even more pronounced, uh, which we're not going to get to this quarter, in Titus chapter 1. So go back and read that. So it just really emphasizes what we've said here. But as we conclude chapter 3, ultimately Paul's major concern in both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 is to ensure faithfulness of the church for the deposit, and that being the faith. And the church needs those who are models and leaders as they point the way to others. It's a significant chapter. It's very significant on really the idea of guarding this trust that of being sound doctrine. I've been fortunate. I've not really been in any congregations where things really got bad, but I've had other people I've talked to, and I think that's what it comes down to. If you don't have a strong eldership, then the church is in trouble. So, uh, Before we move into chapter 4, does anyone have any comments? Yeah, let me... Okay. Yeah. You just can't have one. There has to be more. So why is it that these people are letting maybe, it has to be maybe one person that's convincing them to, to do this? Because you're supposed to be learned. The Bible teaches us what is 
2 Timothy 2.15, that we're to rightly divide the word of truth. So how can they say that they're praying? They prayed on this situation, right. and they've been revealed. But what was, where were they years ago? Right. You know, when they were teaching that it was wrong, and now all of a sudden, they have a new revelation. Sure. This concerns me, and elders are overseers. We're responsible for our soul salvation, but they are also responsible for right. leading the flock to righteousness. And, and they're, they're so, going to be held to an account, too, yes. aren't they? Yeah, so I, I know for a fact, I mean, there's no example I see in the Bible where it's one elder. It's always a plurality. It's, it's multiple individuals. I think in the denominational world, I have several friends that are Baptist, and I think that quite varies, but, but uh, it seems like there's some indications, at least what I gather, at least in some of those congregations of the Baptist church, that you really have one individual that kind of runs a show or makes the decisions. Or you may have, maybe you have multiple elders, but you may have one elder that's really the one that's very influential, the one that's very assertive or whatever, and, and maybe it's a matter that everyone else kind of goes along just so we can get along. So, but you're right, I, I, I just think it comes down to that. I, I'm glad he devotes a whole chapter to that to church leadership and just how absolutely important that is. And you're right, we have a responsibility too. It's just not all on the elders. I mean, each of us has a responsibility to live a faithful life, and we certainly want to do what we can to support our elders. And one of the things we can do is, is live that faithful life and be willing to help along the lines in terms of serving whatever capacity that we can. But, um, but just like the issues we had uh, 2,000 years ago there at Ephesus, you know, we're seeing the same things again, sadly. You know, you, have, you do have to have a polarity of elders. You have to have more than one. And uh, I actually, it's my own opinion, but I actually think you need more than two. Uh, but a lot of times you, you don't have enough men in the congregation, especially the small congregation, that are qualified. Right. And there you have a problem of... of men appointing themselves as overseers or you have the, the preacher himself that takes charge. Right. And um, then again, like you was talking about, you may have one elder that's more assertive than the rest of them. There you have a problem of having a head elder. Right, yes. Which, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's problems unless all the elders are in agreement. Sure, sure. I, I, um, there's a few times I filled in for a little small congregation, um, and it was outside of Hillsboro, a little city called Bynum, a little farming community. There's about three families there, I think about 12, 13. I don't think there were any elders. I don't even know if there was any deacons. So, you know, and I, ha I don't know how they went about kind of managing themselves or whatever. It seems like there was one individual that was a leader, and I guess by nature, if you get a small group like that, that you may have someone that stands up. But I do agree with you. I think actually in these smaller congregations, it may even be far more of a challenge. You know, look what happened to Matt Bransford recently out in West Texas. You know, he gets this preaching position out there, and from my understanding is that there were some things he was preaching that it was just a member of the church that disagreed with. Matt was in the right, but the person disagreed with that, and apparently he was also the one who, you know, maybe had some significant pull. I don't know if he was an elder or not, but because one individual looked at the decision that was made, and he was let go, sadly. So I think there's a danger there of having one individual that makes those decisions. I think, I, I agree. I think by wisdom, I think you need to have, you need to have multiple people there to be able to also watch one another. <laughs> I've always looked at this pass or at these passages uh, and these re requirements as being what God is looking for and being the top of what He wants. And so this isn't just something that is um, to it, it, it is just about elders or deacons. It really should be about every one of us. And yes, whether you're male or female, there, you know, there's. But it should be our goal to be like these things that are being required here. If that was the case, if everybody was in that mindset, 
how much oh, sure. better would our congregations be, et cetera. Oh, so right. this is the example. Right. Oh, I, I very much agree with that. And I think I maybe made a passing comment at some point, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a laudable um, goal for all of us to have, to live this kind of life. And, but as, as Paul says, look at, how, look at how much influence that you can have. I mean, he points there, I want you to have such an impeccable character, I want people outside the church to be able to see that and be impressed with it. So, so I agree with you. I think, I think it's a goal that we should all try to attain. I know there's one or two things. Certainly, I'm, I'm not married, so, so that's one thing that you know, to mark off. But all those other things, all those other, all those other attributes, they're very admirable things that we should all try to, to uh, pursue. But as I said, I, I, I also want to mention in passing, because you know, certainly the elders are going to be held to an account for the way that uh, they conduct themselves in that office, but I think it's all the more paramount for us as members of the church to be there to help them to do their job and to be there to support them in any way we can. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge for the 21st century. And, and while the church is always going to be there, the church is going to be victorious. But, you know, but how many people are going to share in that victory in the end? I think that's the question, you know. And, and I think the 21st century, I think, I think, sadly, I think the church is in trouble in terms of a lot of people that are, that are just kind of going away from what the truth is. And uh, whether, it, well, as I said, in the end, I think it comes down to the elders. They have to stand up and say, no, it's not scriptural. You can't do something like that. So anyone else have any other comments? Okay, we only have about nine minutes, but let me go ahead and start out in chapter four. So he's instructed Timothy, all right, one of the things that, that we need to do in Ephesus is you need to have strong church leaders. That's just absolutely key. But now, here in chapter 4, he's going to use this analogy of training like an athlete in terms of confronting this change that's taking place. And these athletes is going to be Timothy and Titus. And now he's going to give them additional encouragement. We mentioned at the beginning of the class that throughout here, you know, I have no doubt Timothy's committed. He's faithful. He wants to do a great job. But maybe because of his youth, um, he needs some encouragement. And we're going to see more here in chapter 4 as Paul's going to speak to him about thinking about uh, your work here as being that of an athlete. And so there's some really compelling verses here. So, but while he speaks here about elders, the book is actually written to Timothy and giving his advice and his encouragement uh, here in this chapter of how you're going to go about confronting this change, but he equates it here to being that of an athlete. So the previous chapter, as I said, speaks about those elders with experience and knowledge of the Christian faith and how that equipped those leaders for the task of confronting false teachers. And mind you, that's the issue here with Ephesus and the false teachers. However, these epistles are not written to those elders, but to Paul's envoys. First and Second Timothy is written to Timothy, and Titus is written to Titus. They're the ones who are going to have to confront this. And so they have a decisive role in the church. And facing really a daunting task, at least to me it seems like this would be a daunting task, you know, for these two individuals. In a period of really transition, again, they are to guard the deposit, guard the faith. He mentions that in First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. And of this Christian message, really to protect the church from false teachers. Furthermore, they were to give instruction about Christian behavior. We'll see in Titus chapter 2, most of that chapter is devoted to Christian living. And to ensure that the church's future through the establishment of faithful leaders who would teach others. And that's what we just looked at. So the task of these young men are clearly reflected in the many instructions which Paul gives them. They were to instruct and to teach. You know, during a discourse, use that as an opportunity to teach and instruct what truth is. They are to exhort. That term means urge strongly to give a warning. And you find that the instruction, and we'll find here, is somewhat unique in terms of the responsibilities and the duties that 
that Timothy and Titus have, they're just not evangelists. They have a little more to it. And one of those things is in terms of this exhorting, is exhorting elders. They're also told to appoint elders. So there's a unique, a unique task here that Paul has given them. But they are also to reprove, to correct, and to express disapproval. And as I said again, that also includes that disapproval toward elders if the truth's not being taught. And, you know, this is something that Timothy's going to have to confront with the eldership there at Ephesus. What's going on is, is not truth. It's not based on Scripture, and it's got to change. So their major functions we find here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It says here, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you wage the good warfare. That's one of the functions that these men are having to do. They're having to wage a good warfare. Having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered a shipwreck. So we'd already gone over that verse. But also in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says here, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. So you are to wage the good warfare, Timothy. And you're also, the things that you've heard, you're now to convey those things to faithful men. So Timothy and Titus are the connecting link between Paul and those local churches which will be facing these perilous circumstances in changing times. They're the envoy. You have this apostle that has sent these two individuals out. Uh, the future of the church rests on what has been committed from Paul to Timothy to those faithful men who will teach others. Uh, we're never told the official capacity of either, just their capabilities and what they need to go out and do. But as I mentioned, so in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, uh, Paul writing to Titus says, From this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. Not every evangelist can do something like that. This is, a unique, this is a unique task for Titus and Timothy. I want you to go out there and appoint elders based on the qualifications we have that we were just looking at. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 5, you know, for Timothy there, it says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. So you remember that term, exhort, to urge strongly, to give warning. So for these older men, these mature men that are in the church that have these leadership roles, you have the function of being able to exhort them. You have to warn them. You have to get them back on the right pathway. But he continues there, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So it seems like they had some authority over elders in terms of appointing them and also in the point of, at times, having to exhort them, to warn them, you need to get back on this pathway. So Timothy and Titus did not possess the qualifications of elders who are presumed to be older men, but were messengers. However, we do see here a partial, um, a partial idea of what we see for the evangelist of today. I mean, there's certain things that we see there that uh, for men who are out there proclaiming God's word, they can be a model for. And as I said here, this chapter is going to speak with these connotations about being an athlete and about how you go about training, um, not only training to proclaim the word, but in this case, you know, the training that you're going to have to do, Timothy, to confront these false teachers. So Timothy and Titus have their own responsibilities which provide an opportunity, uh, an example for uh, those today who are uh, preachers. So Timothy is told in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise, your, your, um, exercise yourself toward godliness. So the future of the church requires good preachers, and Timothy and Titus are going to serve here as a model for those of today. Thus, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 16, and we won't be able to get to that to next week. It's going to reflect the task of the teacher. And so with that, we'll go ahead and stop there, and we'll pick up next week in verse 1. So.
Thank you very much for your time.